I would now uh, introduce uh, Professor Dr. Lloyd Scott. Professor Lloyd Scott is an experienced academician with a demonstrated history of working in the built environment higher education sector. He is skilled in supervision of research students, knowledge in the sustainability education, research design and lecturing. He is a strong education professional with a doctor of philosophy focused in educational assessment, evaluation and research from the University of Salford. He is professor of practice at University of Oklahoma. I once again welcome you, sir, to this knowledge sharing forum, and I would request you to address the participants, please. Over to you, Dr. Lloyd. OK, um, good afternoon and welcome, everybody. And thank you for, for your kind introductions, Director of Management and, and Sheikha. Um, I'm very pleased to be here with you. Um, I, may I share the screen, if I may, actually, if that's OK? Sure, so. Yeah, I just it might be easier for me to navigate through the slides if, if I share the screen. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. So. Okay. Now, can you can you see that? Is that so? Right now, it's it's yes, uh, yes. Okay, I I'll, I'll just go from the from the slideshow. Okay, so okay. um, as I say, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm coming to you live from Dublin. Dublin is in Ireland, uh, as you can see from the map there, just out here on the on the far edge of of, of Europe. And we're a member of the European Union. We have we're a small country in in comparison to you in in, in India, in that we've only got 4.9 million of a population, and the capital of of <clears throat> of, of Ireland is Dublin, where I'm based, and I'm based there in the Technological University of Dublin. And in Ireland, um, we have 14 universities. A small country, but we actually uh, we actually um, <clears throat> have an opinion that education is very, very important. And you can see there, while we're four and a half hours time difference, we're actually about eight eight uh, eight eight thousand kilometers apart from each other. So, so a little bit of a distance. And I know throughout the world, we're all dealing with COVID nineteen. And I suppose one of the positive things of COVID-19 has given us such an opportunity to use the electronic means in which to share knowledge and to share practice. And I'm really delighted to be here with you today to give you some of the small amount of knowledge that I have in the area of, of research. Um, just a, a little bit more about me. Um, originally, when I started my, my professional life, I trained as a carpenter joiner. Uh, so, so, so someone working in the construction industry, working with my hands, using wood to actually uh, help, help society, if you like. Uh, there was a downturn in the construction industry, and because of that downturn, I turned to education, and I got a scholarship to go to the University of Limerick, where I studied wood and building technology, and I went into education. And I'm some 33 years now in, in education, and I have always maintained my link with industry. Um, I'm in higher education. I was teaching in high school for a number of years, but I'm in higher education since the year 2000s. As was mentioned earlier, I'm an academic within the School of Surveying and Construction Management, and I have kind of straddled two areas of research. One where my PhD was in assessment practices in education in the built environment, and the other is sustainable construction, because there's certainly a need to address and educate constructors around the whole uh, environmental and climate change agenda. So I, I do believe that's a really important area. Um, I'm currently the chair of the conference chair of the Association of Researchers in Construction Management. And this uh, September, we're running our 36th annual conference. Uh, it was to be in Glasgow in Scotland, in, in the UK. But unfortunately, we've had to actually now convert it to a virtual conference due, due to COVID-19. I have a, a, an amount of publications. 
10 journal papers in, in academic journals. I've written a book and I have seven chapter, chapters within, within uh, different publications um, in, in the area of sustainability and, and education. And I have at this point 85 peer reviewed uh, conference papers. I'm the associate editor of the International Journal of Construction, Education and Research. Uh, where I have this in the last two years reviewed 168 papers, but for the journal itself, 240 in total over the years. Um, I also am an expert that actually reviews elements of construction for, for the construction industry. So I'm often called upon by the industry to actually provide expert information around, around construction. I'm also the associate editor of the Mass Timber Journal, and I also review for a number of other journals. As was mentioned, I'm a visiting professor or professor of practice at, at Oklahoma University in the, UK, in, the, in the US, where I actually teach sustainable construction, but I also actually coach and mentor faculty, both in the area of research and in the area of, of actually student competitions. And I've just been, it's just been announced that I'm a visit, going to be a visiting pre professor at the Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. So you can see there, I have a, a, a good history around education and research, okay? What I want to share with you today is really, I want to actually look at the literature review and look at the important aspects around literature review. Draw some of the linkages together, but also offer some of the approaches around, okay? some of the approaches around around approaches to research and then we're going to give a good amount of time around questions and, and to take the questions that you, that you may have arising from from my presentation so the starting point with, with a, any particular topic is you know what is a literature review and there's there's different uh, opinions out there there's different views out there and there's different approaches out there and i'm going to take you through some of those different views and positions but an important thing for you in your own subject area is for you to understand what a literature review means for you. And I say that because as, as a researcher, if you, if you, if whether you're a, a, an early career researcher, and I include PhD and master's students in that, whether you're a beginning or whether you're actually well established, you, you need to know what the literature is actually saying in your subject area because that's the basis on how people view your, your area, your research area. And so in terms of definitions, uh, it's the expectation uh, of, of a systematic literature review. In other words, any literature relating to a matter, which is supposed to be question raising so that new directions for research can be opened up. And, and what I mean by that is that, you know, we're all, we all talk about research. And we all talk about uh, contributing to the body of knowledge that's out there. Well, if you're going to contribute to the body of knowledge, you need to know what the current body of knowledge is. Therefore, it's, it's, it's imperative that you actually understand what your subject area actually is saying. And an important area for any researcher is to be current. Because if you're writing uh, on a topic, and that topic is ever changing. And, and, I, and I would argue that all research areas change because we're, they're all influenced by the current environment in which, which we live, exist, participate in. So therefore, this, the, your literature review, the literature that impacts on your subject area is always changing. And you need to keep associated with that and, and be current. Um, and you know, uh, what I notice as a reviewer, for example, of, of the International Journal of Construction, Education and Research, an area that, that people fall down on is that they actually don't scope out the literature and they actually are lacking in terms of their currency. In other words, how current the, the literature is when they put a paper through to the journal. And that's often a criticism that actually is sent back, you know, that the literature review is not substantial it actually doesn't address all of the elements that it should address. So an important element of literature review is that you are current. And one way to keep yourself current 
is to be associated with academic journals. Know the subjects uh, journals that are associated to you. And also then, because we're living in an electronic age, sign up to the alerts that these journals offer you. These journals, if you, if you, you, know, if you take any of the, the, the publishing houses, Emerald, Taylor & Francis, uh, um, Springer, they all have uh, a facility within each journal that you can keep updated on what's current and what's coming through. Um, and again, another element of, it, of, of uh, a definition around literature review is a piece of academic writing includes current knowledge on a topic, substantive findings, theories, and methodological contributions. And there's a lot actually in that central uh, uh, element there in terms of defining literature review. You know, what is the current knowledge? What are the findings emerging? What is what's coming through? What are the theories that underpin that topic? You know, what are our current writers actually theorizing about and actually using that theory to actually benefit the subject area? And what are the methodological contributions? What methodologies are people within the subject area actually using to actually make that contribution? And I think that that's really, really important. And I'll come back to that in, in, in a few moments when we talk about the types of, of literature review. Uh, literature review is generally related to secondary sources. You know, you're reporting on actual work that's out there that's current. It doesn't necessarily uh, report new or original experimental work because that new or experimental work, if it's done by you, the researcher, is that contribution to knowledge. Okay. It may contain current information and information and knowledge are different things. So the important thing to remember is that you may be reporting on something in your literature review uh, that actually might impact on the work that you're doing. An example of that would be that actually if a government has produced statistical figures that actually can uh, emphasize or actually make a point around what it is you found in the literature, that's an example of information that's actually can impact in terms of your literature review. So again, that's, that's an important difference. Okay. So Miriam, uh, back in 1998, and I deliberately actually included their different definition, they described the literature review as an interpretation and synthesis of public work. Okay. So, so I think that's really, really important here. And your interpretation as the researcher, and then your interpretation drawing from other, you know, elements of literature, and then synthesizing that published work, and showing your understanding of it, and that understanding and how it relates to what your project or research inquiry is. So again, you're you're as the researcher responsible for interpreting what the literature says and getting your understanding of what the literature says. And um, it's, it's uh, important that you synthesize that and, and show that understanding. And again, that's what a good literature review is. Whether that's a literature review as a PhD student along your journey, or whether that's a literature review for a piece of research that you're publishing, okay? So I mentioned public, published works, I mentioned interpretation, and I mentioned synthesis. And the expla explanation of uh, published work, uh, you know, and I, I do say relates that Miriam's work is back in 1998, but I actually do believe it is a current statement and it's appropriate for the world we live in today. So hence I used it. If I believed that there was a more uh, appropriate current statement or description, I would use that. But for me, navigating the literature on research, uh, 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 literature review, I believe that Miriam's statement is seminal and it actually is current. Um, so again, 
it's a, it's published work goes out in the public domain. You know, and again, in the public domain, if you're talking in academia, which is the context of, of our conversation today, so so within the academic community, your published work needs to have currency, it needs to be correct, it needs to report, interpret and synthesize correctly. So, so that's why a literature is actually really, really, really important. In terms of published work, back in 1998, we were you know, advancing into the technological revolution, but we actually relied heavily on uh, published, as in material that was actually written, printed journals, printed books and the like, where now published encompasses web-based sources and the like. So it's important uh, to, to actually understand that, okay? Um, another important aspect of, of published work is that you actually need to demonstrate to the reader that you, are, you have examined the relevant sources and you are offering a critical approach to that interpretation of those critical sources that are out there. And again, that, that's really, really important. Um, you know, if you take uh, uh, take the point of a PhD student, and they come to Aviva, they've they've, they've done all their literature review, they've presented their research, they have it in a, in a complete thesis, and they've submitted their thesis, and at Viva, at the interview, at the end of the process, the examiner actually mentions a piece of work, and the actual candidate hasn't actually reviewed that piece of work. That's a critical flaw, one would say, in someone's work. You know, you don't want a situation like that. You don't want a situation if you're presenting to a journal or a conference for someone to highlight, actually, you haven't included the work of X person who's an expert in the field. So, so you know, when you're talking about a critical review, you're talking about fully encompassing all those aspects. And again, as a researcher, you need to be actually very clear that you're getting to all those sources. And I would argue it's probably more difficult today because we have access to so many technologies and so many different approaches to actually try and capture everything. But the important thing is when you're setting the context for your research that you actually are able to put the boundary around the research to say what's actually included in the research and what's not included. And that boundary should allow you to actually critique the literature in that area. So, so that, that to me is really, really important. Interpretation, you need as a researcher to be able to interpret the literature. You know, that's what a literature review is when you're reading through list material. You actually need to understand what is actually going on in that subject area. So, so interpretation and understanding are really, really key. The synthesis element then refers to bringing the material together from the different sources and being able to offer a whole case scenario from the review that you've done. And again, that might be actually indicating elements to say, actually, this I review this aspect of a piece of work, but it's actually not so relevant to this particular research that we're doing. But the important thing is in your synthesis, you justify why you're not going to consider that element. So synthesis includes justification of your work. Um, so so it's, it, it, it's really, really important. It's linking your interpretation, but actually pulling all those elements together and providing the evidence. OK, so um, how does this all link in? And I know this, this is a complex and comp quite a complex slide, so I'm going to take a few moments on it to actually take you through it. OK, um, so, so to be all encompassing, you have to address certain questions. And some of those questions may differ from what I have here. But the important thing is in your research inquiry, that you identify the questions that actually need to be scoped out in the literature review. So if we start at the, at the blue one on the bottom, what are the main questions and problems that have to be addressed, that have been addressed so far? So really what you're scoping out is where from the literature is 
the, the topic or the research area that you're looking at? Where is it now? Okay. What have people been, been looking at? And, and you can actually draw that out and highlight it. And again, in your review, you could say, you can make, uh, draw a reference to elements by saying that actually the main problem has moved on from a, an earlier one, or, or again, showing that you have an understanding and uh, through your interpretation of, of actually what's happening. Uh, what are the origins and definitions of the topic? Again, that's the historical evolution of the research area that you're looking at. You need to understand that. You need to, if you're, for example, researching pragmatism as, as a topic, you need to know where pragmatism orientated from. You would need to, you know, it came from the US, for example, and you would need to know the, uh, who, were, who, who were the key movers at the time. You know, where, where has it moved to? Where is it today? So there's, you know, two schools of thought. If you take pragmatism, for example, you know, you have the US view and you actually have the kind of European view of pragmatism nowadays. And, you know, so, so that has evolved over time. And the way you get to, to understanding that is you interact with the literature, you know, and the literature that, has, that demonstrates the history and the emergence of the topic. You, know. you need to know in certain areas what is the political standpoint, particularly if you're doing research that impacts on policy, you need as the researcher to know what are the, the political nuances and what, what, what is society saying in relation to your particular area. You need to identify the key sources. It's important if you're talking about pragmatism that you, you, you talk about Wittgenstein or um, uh, uh, Peters or, or other, other uh, uh, people from that field. So again, you're demonstrating that you understand the actual key underpinning areas that have been addressed over, over, over time. What are the key theories, concepts, and ideas? So with pragmatism as the example, you need to be able to say what define pragmatism, define pragmatism in your research context. So for example, it, it, pragmatism may be different, for example, in my area, construction man management. Uh, I write a little bit about that in, in my research. And, and I've been challenged by people within the construction management field to say, actually, we're not pragmatists, we're actually interpretivists or we're actually fundamentalists or whatever. So, again, you need to know those theories that underpin pragmatism to be able to make the argument that actually it does stand up. Uh, the major issues and debates about the topic is important. What are the key theories and concepts and ideas coming forward? Uh, what are the epistemological and ontological grounds for the discipline? So, so again, you know, what, how do you know what you know about the topic? What is it that actually defines the topic? Where are the debates going on in your discipline? And you need to be able to link that in. They may not actually be upfront in your literature review, but as, as a researcher, you actually need to be very, very aware of those. And how is knowledge of the topic structured and organized? So, so you know, you, you should be able to actually demonstrate that you know the Journal of X is where all the literature on your, on your topic gets disseminated, or there might be a series of journals where it's actually your work is disseminated. Like I'm a reviewer for, associate editor for a journal that I've actually only done an editorial for, I've never actually published in, because my work doesn't necessarily sit in this journal, even though it's an education journal. Um, but it's, it's American-centric, and my work is not American-centric, so therefore I don't publish in, in that journal. Okay, so, so again, those elements you need to be think, thinking of in terms of where they sit with your literature review. I mentioned earlier different focuses of lit review. So one is a critical review of your related research. So you're getting to grips and an understanding of the literature in your fields and, and how that's emerging and evolving. But also it is usually necessary to understand 
the literature review of the research methodology that underpins your subject area. And I think that's where a lot of researchers fall down. I certainly would say that's one of the comments, the regular comments that I give to, to um, journal papers that come to the journals that I review for, that the, their methodological approach doesn't sit with the subject area. Um, you know, so if you take, for example, construction management, because construction management is, uh, is, is about people and processes, we are very much moving towards, and I say moving towards, and I'll explain that in a moment, we're very much moving towards a more qualitative, even f following to, into a mixed methods, methodological position. Qualitative and mixed methods because we're not just trying to quantify scientific data, we're actually trying to interpret and understand the players in the construction management process. So within that, we actually are trying to understand people's behaviors, people's attitudes, people's emotions, the way people behave. So it, you're interpreting that. So therefore, it's actually linked to qualitative research. We're not just about numbers and, and calculating, you know, numbers. There's an, ele an element of quantifying material and qualifying research in our area, but the main tenet of our research is around qualitative research. So you as the researcher would need to be familiar with what's the methodological underpinning. And also then, what is the current debate within your subject area? And I say that because that's one of the areas that I focus on at the moment is actually making the case for qualitative research in construction management. And that's where a lot of our discourse is. That's where a lot of uh, time we spend time at seminars and workshops discussing that and trying to get a better understanding. And for me, as, as a researcher, because I'm a, a pragmatist by nature, I'm trying to link it to pragmatism as an approach. And again, I'm just giving you snippets here because you know the, the time timing here for this uh, presentation is only short. And I'm trying to give you some uh, snippets of elements that you might consider in your own area. You know, whether it's science, whether it's business, uh, whether it's uh, uh, um, um, information technology. Um, so. It's, under, it's important to understand the distinction between the two, the critical review of your subject area and the critical review of the methodological positioning. And while the, the, the latter doesn't require your constant attention, you do need to be up, up, up to date on what's happening in your field. So getting started, some questions you might ask yourself when you start reading, okay? What is specific thesis? What's the problem? What's the research question that your literature will help to define? You know, and that might sound like straightforward, but actually people jump in and, and it's like going down a rabbit hole. You know, you actually decide that actually this is really interesting and you get pulled away from actually the literature you should be looking at. And that's that, you know, what I find with my own PhD and master's students is they actually, you know, come back and say, oh, this paper was really interesting. And my first question is always, how relevant is that to your work? And often is the case, the paper might be interesting, but it actually really doesn't define what it is they're looking for. Okay. So again, you know, have those questions to hand, have them nearby. What are you actually looking for in your literature review? Then what type of literature review am I conducting? Is it theory? Is it methodology? Is it quantitative research, etc.? Uh, so, so it really depends, you know, what you're looking for. And if you're if you're clear on those, it actually helps you focus your work. Again, the scope of your literature review. And again, that might be looking at publications that you want to use that you should use. Okay, so so it's really really important at the starting point to map that out because when you're doing the literature review, it's very easy to go, to go off, off track, okay? Some further questions that you might ask yourself, you know, uh, you know, and this might be a reflection during the process. How good was my information seeking? You know, has my search uh, been wide enough to ensure I found all the relevant material? 
you know, just think back to that example I mentioned at the PhD visa. Have you actually covered all the literature that is necessary that? So again, you know, do you, do, do you start broad? Do you start narrow? You know, uh, what approach do you take? If you're writing a paper, it's, you know, you can, it's not really, uh, you know, 10,000 words of, of a research paper, or 15,000 words, you know, that's not your literature review, literature review from your PhD, for example. So again, you, can, you might be actually reporting on an aspect of your research. So think about that. What material do you need to put in that? You can't put everything in. So what research material is relevant? So again, that's, that's really, really important. And then it comes on to the critical analysis of the literature. And it, for me, sometimes when I teach research methods, that's the thing students ask about. They struggle with that. So again, you know, you, you need to be very focused. You need to have no distractions. You know, the mobile phone should be left away when you're actually analyzing something because, you know, you can be distracted. So you need to immerse yourself in that. So what I would say is that you carve out time to do this literature review with no distractions, that the, the email is switched off, that while you might have internet access, you're actually sourcing the literature that's appropriate to your material. And then you're going down through that literature critically. You know, when, it, when an author makes a statement, you know, be critical about that statement that they make. Is it correct? Does it go against what your, your thinking is? If it goes against what your thinking is, actually, how does it go against that? What's your justification for actually uh, challenging that, those concepts, those ideas that, that an author is putting forward? That's criticality, you know, and that's really important. And, and it's not easy, but what you need to do as the researcher is you need to build up that confidence on, on the criticality. And the only way to build up your confidence and the only way to get good at that is to spend time critically analyzing. Uh, what, what I encourage my own students to do, uh, what I do myself is I actually talk to people, discuss my work, discuss papers. Uh, I think one of the positive things for me as a reviewer is when I review a paper and I make comments, I put those into a system and the other reviewers make comments as well. And I compare those comments with other people's comments. So, you know, an early career researcher, you, you could actually uh, work with somebody, be mentored by someone or work with someone that you're close to and shared that work, maybe analyze papers with people. Uh, it's one of the exercises I give research students to do. I give them a paper to review and I give them, I ask them to actually critically analyze it, pick out the important points, and then come back and actually present them to, to the group. And then we discuss it. So again, you know, informal actual groups are really help, helpful when you're doing a critical uh, uh, literature review. Uh, so you could, could team up with someone. Again, that, that's, a, that's a really helpful tip if you want uh, to actually help you because, you know, building your confidence around critical analysis can be, can be a challenge. So actually, if you have a structure, you know, an informal or formal structure that you can do that, that's really, really helpful. And it does take time. Um, have I cited and discussed studies contrary to my perspective? You know, it's, you, you know, we hear the word bias actually put, put around in relation to research. You know, that piece of work was biased. Well, if you're looking at literature, are you being biased? Are you only looking at the papers where your perspective has actually agreed with? You know, the good thing about research is that you're actually challenging what's there currently. That's the function of research is to move your research area on by challenging the things that have actually been done in the past. That's how we change our view. That's how, how knowledge actually gets uh, built over time. So, so again, 
you know, are you actually seeking out those papers or those pieces of research or those pieces of work that actually are contrary to your perspective? And are you actually challenging yourself? Because if you do, you're actually doing something really, really valuable. You're actually negating some of that bias that we actually have as researchers. You know? So again, you know, if, if there's a strong enough reason to actually negate somebody else's work, you know, make justify your words, justify with words what it is that you feel actually is not appropriate here or why you actually have a different perspective. You know, and, and we know subjectivity is a really, really important element. And again, as an examiner of PhDs, I love to see candidates coming forward challenging actually previous work once they justify what it is they actually are challenging. That's really, really important. That's how we move our subject areas on, okay? And then the other thing is, is your literature review relevant, appropriate, and useful, you know? Um, and one way to start yourself on the publishing journey, often conferences, peer-reviewed conferences, actually uh, attract conference papers that are just a literature review. So my advice to, to people who, who may be starting on their PhD journey is to actually structure in along your journey that you get a publication in a journal or an academic journal of your literature review. And again, that, that's an output from your research, but it also is that uh, it's, it's, you know, conference papers and, and journal papers are peer reviewed. So they're being reviewed by peers in your field. And if your literature review is of a sufficient standard and is appropriate and is useful, it will be published. So again, have that in the back of your mind when you're structuring you know, a paper on literature review. This could be published. And if you are a PhD student, it's always good, excellent to come to Vivas with publications in the bag. In other words, publications already out there. And, and, because that's a contribution to the fields and that shows the currency and relevancy of your work. So that's really, really important. Um, okay, we're still continuing on and just keep, you know, keeping an eye on, on the time. Uh, you can add two other questions of, of your own to focus the, the search, you know, what period of time am I working within, you know, is there a geographical area or setting, uh, is there a social context, you know, uh, are there certain materials linked to this, okay, and, and why I say that is because, you know, the, the geographical may be very important or the period of time that you're researching, if you're, if you're a, a historian, for example, you know, it would be very, very important to actually set the scope in terms of timing, when, when it's from, when it's to, you know. Uh, I would always argue that, you know, the title of a paper, the title of a thesis should have a context. So, you know, uh, an exploratory study of construction students' attitudes to assessment practice, okay? If that was the title of my research, one would expect to see all construction management education included worldwide. That's not feasible or possible. So, so there may be a, a situation in your title that, you know, uh, exploring the uh, construction management students' attitude to assessment in Irish higher education. Now you have a geographical location or a boundary. When, I, when, the, when the person reads that, they actually know what they're dealing with. So you'll often see papers, you know, with a geographical uh, orientation or a, or, or a context. That's what I call it. And that context allows you as the, as the researcher re looking for, f as part of your re literature review, looking for papers. Well, you might say to yourself, well, it's in, in the US or it's, in, it's actually in um, our Europe or whatever. And that won't be relevant to the work I'm doing because the setting is not appropriate. The, you know, the, the structure of the educational system or whatever it might be is different. So it's important to actually uh, understand that. And that's why I would consider 
context as very, very important. Okay. Uh, do you start at the narrow and work out, or do you start wide and focus in? And again, you know, one one is good in one situation, and one is is is, is better in a different situation. So again, you need to decide on what the focus is. Do I start uh, wide and narrow it in, or actually do I narrow it and then? build it out wide. Situation of going narrow first is if you have a particular research problem or a gap you see in, in, in the research area, well, you may want to look at it in, in narrow focus first and then look out further afield to see have there been any solutions in other areas, for example. So again, context is, is, is really, really important. <clears throat> Just moving on then to types of literature review, it's systematic, it's scoping a systematic review, a scoping literature review, a traditional stroke narrative review, or you have a rapid review. Okay, and systematic relates to explicit and transparent methods. It's a standards set for stages. It's accountable. It's replicable, and it's updatable. So you can see the advantage of a systematic review. Uh, what we see in construction management these days is that. You know, students, because of technology and because uh, you can use uh, different systems to actually search uh, electronic journals, etc., and, and use uh, keywords, etc., we see a lot of systematic reviews coming through. Uh, again, some, some subject areas actually have, have a similar nature, uh, social science, for example, as well. So people are starting to use technology to actually do, to, to, you know, to scope and, and, and map out the, the, the systematic review. A difficulty with that is there might be a paper somewhere along the journey that you actually might miss out on. So there can be a, a flaw, even though a systematic would, would suggest that you're all encompassing. But if you don't use the right parameters, you could miss out on something. So that's, that's a, an important one. Um, Scoping literature review is similar to systematic, but it's actually all relevant integrated uh, research, you know, uh, so you're actually including a lit review that's all encompassing, you know, and that's probably a situation where it's kind of a scattergun and you have to actually then within that refine that down in order to get to where it is you want to, want to go. I would say uh, for uh, research students starting off, the scoping literature review can be a big challenge because they haven't really tied down what it is they want to research. So again, you know, start off with that. Be be comfortable in the vulnerability around you're actually scoping out everything, but be disciplined in tr trying to actually f uh, put in place what's actually relevant and what's not. That's the difficulty with it. It relates to what I said earlier on. Oh, this paper is interesting. I'll read further. And it was a very interesting paper, very interesting methodology, very interesting literature review, but it's actually not really focused on your research. So be disciplined if you're getting into something that is actually not quite associated with your research area. Dump it. Move on. Because time, time is, a, is a factor. And yes, it's nice to have that little bit of knowledge about a piece of research, and, and it's nice to read a really good and interesting paper. However, you have a body of, of literature to review, and, and, and you need to be structured about that. Um, traditional narrative review is where you're critiquing and summarizing a body of literature that's already out there. You know, a good starting point for researchers is to look at previous research theses, you know, uh, or if you come across a paper, you know, that's, that's linked to your research area and you actually should go straight to the references and see within the references what are those actual papers that are associated with the topic. You know, that's, you know, again, that's a, a, that's a, te a technique that a, that a reviewer should have in their bag about actually trying to actually find out within a paper, can I get some, something more out of this particular paper? Rapid reviews relate to doing a literature review, you know, that is urgent. So it might be the case where you've been called in to work on a research project. Uh, COVID-19 would be an example. And you need to actually gather literature around that topic very, very quickly. 
So again, you know, time and resources are, are key. So it's a matter of actually having a good structure about how to do that. You know, but but again, that's called upon at different different times. So if you are a researcher in the fields, uh, you know, or if, if there's a call for expressions of interest in a research area, well, part of that that call is is to put forward a literature that's relevant to the topic so a rapid review relates to that that sort of, of scenario if you like okay so getting i'm still on the getting started elements of this talk uh, so key considerations have a plan keep a record in other words be organized and store your gathered material and i think you know that's one of the things i struggle with i've always struggled with being organized and having my tip material in the right place. So if I'm looking for, uh, you know, a piece, a piece of research that I did or, or an actual um, article that, that I recall that someone within, within the discipline has done, you know, how do I actually access that quickly and, and clearly, you know? So, so I would suggest to you is to be organized, you know, keep that, keep that filing system, you know, uh, whether it's lit review for methodology, whether it's lit review for topic, what that topic is, how do you go to that? You know, it could be six months between the time you actually gather material and actually read it, for example. How do you know that they're the relevant articles when you go back to them? What's the prompting element when you go into the folder and look into, within the folder and see actually what paper do I need to look at here? So again, it's important to be, to be organized and have your plan around that. Um, so I mentioned different ways earlier and that we've moved on from Mary Mann's kind of uh, uh, books and journals approach, uh, relevant literature uh, and, and how we find it, you know. So electronic searches are, are really, really helpful nowadays. Uh, it's one element we get our PhD students to focus in on. Uh, so, and we were very lucky in Technological University Dublin that the librarians are really, really helpful. And they help students actually get, uh, navigate those those databases in the, in the best way they possibly can, because if it's Scopus, if it's uh, Science Direct, if it's Springer, they all have different ways of actually doing searches, and the nuances of all that can be quite tricky to find your way around. So again, you know, be part of a research group be part of the school or department that you're in, in terms of how people actually navigate that, share the different practices. Uh, we encourage uh, the, the, the PhD students in our institution to actually buddy up with others and find out information from them. And again, you can do that if you have a research group. So that one, was one of the reasons I, I set up our, our research group in sustainable construction practices. It brings architects, it brings engineers, it brings construction managers, brings all the disciplines from the built environment together. And they can help and share actual ways of doing that. You know, ref, go to useful sources, reference sources, you know, the rel recent PhDs, recent publications, they are great places to go to to find the relevant literature that you may want to explore further. Um, and it's not good practice to, to, to actually be, and I'm gonna use the word lazy, lazy about using references. You'll often see in some publications that, you know, someone references a piece of work belonged to somebody else from a different source. You know, go to the original source, I would say, because your interpretation of what the original source says or states may not be the same as what the, the, the actual person you've read is saying. So it's really important to do that. And again, that shows good practice and best practice and it's important. Um, I, I have, I've read a few theses in my time where you have somebody indicating Scott in uh, Murphy, for example. So they haven't even gone to the Murphy source or haven't gone to the Scott source original source even though it's been referenced in murphy to see what, what 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 they said they've used murphy's interpretation of that that's not good practice that shows a, a lack of of depth in relation to to um, um uh, the work hand searching is really really important it's still while the electronic sources are, are good and are correct there may be some 
actual written sources that are not accessible through the electronic system. You know, and it's harder, it's getting harder for, for, for to find those sources, but, but you should keep an eye out. Um, it was quite interesting. I saw an article on a uh, report on our new news yesterday evening. Our, our libraries opened yesterday uh, 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 since the lockdown. They were closed since the start of lockdown. And a, a man was interviewed who uh, was actually in the library. And he said, well, it's actually, I come here to get those sources I can't get online. And it's better to come here and do that. So again, you know, I just thought it was a great example of someone saying that actually not just relying on the electronic I'm actually going to go and find find some of those sources, and um, so so you know be 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 aware that you know some of those hand sources are out there, you know, and you don't necessarily get all of the, the material electronically. Okay, so as part of a literature review, you need to be an active reader. Okay, and an active re reader in this case means that you have to engage with the lit literature. It's not a novel you're reading. It's actually material that you want to actually synthesize, as we said earlier, you know, and get an understanding of. So you need to engage with the literature. You need to identify the arguments. You need to evaluate the evidence the authors use to support their arguments. You need to assess the influences on the evidence or arguments. You need to identify any limitations of the study or design or focus. You need to examine their interpretations made, and you need to decide what extent you can accept the author's argument or conclusions. That's what we mean by active reading. That's what we mean with engaging with the literature. You know, it's not just a case of saying, well, that was a good paper. How was it a good paper? What arguments did the authors make? What evidence did they actually provide to support those arguments? How do those arguments stand up relative to other material? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's really, really important to actually engage with the literature. Okay, so that's my really key message in terms of being an active leader. Okay, so note taking is really, really important, and there's loads of different ways to note take. But again, I'll link that back to your having a correct filing system. If you're taking notes, you know, what are you putting down? Do you have codes for, for particular elements to make, make it easy, make it short, shorter to, to write your notes? If you have coding, do you understand the coding? Is the coding set up, set up in a way that you, when you look at it in six months' time or eight months' time, that actually you understand the notes you took previously? You know, they're, they're really important elements in terms of, of, of um, um, note-taking. So, so to reflect on what you currently do in terms of note-taking. And there's loads of different tools you can use. Uh, I encourage students to make mind maps, you know, map the thing out and map out the elements of it. Or, uh, you know, some people actually can visualize things uh, in a different way to others. So they actually, you know, can actually put down visual messages that actually helps them take them through through, through the, the, the document. So again, mind maps are helpful. Tables are helpful. Index cards. Do you just put it in a narrative in a one big word document? Do you have a, a notebook where you take handwritten notes? Uh, do you use a, a citation manager where you actually download the paper and then input stuff, you know, like Zotero, like um, Mendeley, etc.? cetera? Uh, do you use Evernote, for example, where you drop things in and scribble on it, you know? So again, uh, it, it, different people come at it in different ways. Younger people are, are more used to the electronic world. So again, it would be important to actually follow, follow through on that. Okay. One approach I take is that I actually use it in, in, a, in, in a, a kind of tabular form, you know, put in the author, the title, the year of, of, of the publication, what are the points? Was there any quotes that I needed to take out of it? You know, uh, what's the context of relationship? What's the significance? To my research, are there any important elements of it? Uh, is there it, where there references within that paper that you want to follow up on, and are there any other notes? So again, that's just a format, but you, but it might give you guidance for you to think about actually how it is you might might adopt that. Okay, this one here is a kind of a literature review through a narrative process. So you're looking at different uh, common themes, 
And then you're looking at articles that had those common themes and you're contrasting and comparing. Okay. And then you go move on to, you know, common themes too, which is an element, you know, further, further depth where you're looking at, at gaps, new direction, looking at synthesizing. And then, you know, uh, um, you know, narrative can be very helpful because, you know, usually papers are done through the narrative. You're telling a story. PhD thesis as a narrative. So again, if you use a literature review as a narrative, you can actually, you know, use the literature review process as an actual way of actually building up your knowledge and skill and competence around writing. So again, it, it, depending on where you are on the continuum, I find narrative very helpful for me. I'm not writing as much as I used to. Um, and what I find now is that by actually uh, looking at a, a, a research paper, I will actually pull out from literature review and do it as a narrative. But again, I do it with the focus that I'm actually not practicing in terms of writing every day. One of the processes I used <clears throat> that was very helpful for me in my PhD uh, back in, in, in 2007, 8, up to 12, was I actually wrote 150 words every day something as some aspect of, of my, my PhD. And that gave me a good practice at writing. I, I, don't, I don't do that nowadays because I don't have the time. So what I do is if I'm actually researching a subject area, I will actually do a narrative approach to that. So again, depends on, on where you're at in relation to the process. Um, I mentioned critically appraising the literature. Here's just an example of uh, you know, an abstract, you know, an, an abstract is the, is the critical point to start in the literature review. And this one is from the Lancet Journal, okay, from 1999. And it, 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 you, know, you can't really read it, the topic there, but again, it's, it's to do with development mental disorders. There's a couple of different authors. There's one or two errors that they highlight. But then, you know, the, the abstract is structured in such a way that's very, very clear, very, very helpful. Scientific journals are really good at that. Uh, you know, background, methods, findings, interpretation, you know, and that's what you should be finding in, in a kind of medical science journal, uh, you know, the, the structure like that. But even highlights, the, the yellow there highlights the important elements that, that can be uh, brought back. And this is not my own example, but it, I'm just presenting it as a way you could actually uh, you know, work your way through a literature review and, and highlight that. You could actually pencil in on that elements in relation to it. So again, you know, it, 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 it's, a, it's a method around looking at literature and how that literature feeds into what you're doing. Okay. Because not all uh, narrative or not all uh, the written word is actually relevant. So you can pick out the, the elements that are, that are relevant to you. Um, I would encourage... Uh, people when they're doing a lit review is look at the title, look at the source, where it's coming from, look at the authors, are they seminal, do you recognize them? Uh, so, so if that starting point is good, read the abstract. If the abstract is relevant, then you might want to go to the literature review. You might want to go to the conclusions and recommendations and look at those. You might want to go to the references. But again, you may not read the full paper. You may not, you may read the critical elements around that paper. And again, that comes with practice, that comes with actually spending the time because you know you may have to read full papers for a period of time until you get the understanding around what's relevant, you know, how do I pick out these things, you know. Um, uh, so again, that comes with time, okay. Uh, so what should I record? Again, it really depends on, 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 on you and but linking back to those earlier points I made, you know, uh, this this is a mix here from arts and science based questions. OK, so they're just giving you snippets. How well developed are the teams or arguments? Did the theoretical perspective used introduce any potential bias? Again, critical thinking here, you know, what's the theoretical perspective? Have you picked it up? Is there one? Some papers don't have a theoretical perspective. So again, how do you pick that up, you know? Uh, are you convinced by the interpretations presented? Do you understand the interpretations presented? Are the conclusions supported by preceding argument? You know, I think a lot of authors struggle with conclusions and recommendations. 
I think it should be actually, you know, uh, uh, just rehashing what they actually have rather than presenting what they conclude from the research. You know, and a good paper will have that. You know, the author will actually look as what do I want to conclude here? What do I want to say is profound? What it, what is novel about the research that I've done? Okay, how appropriate are the comparisons made? So you might be reading a, a comparative analysis of something. And it actually doesn't really even relate to the field that you're in. You know, how important is that? Does it matter? You know, did the responses, measurements, categories or techniques used affect the data collection? So you're looking down through the methods they used. What critically can you look, say about the work? Did they, did they car carry out if it was a scientific process? And, and the discipline has a clear way of actually categorizing all of that. Did they follow that completely to the letter of the law? If they didn't, did they justify why they didn't? Okay. Is their data, you know, uh, the data collected, is it, is it correct? So they did a survey and they actually got people to answer the questions, but actually 50% of, of those surveyed uh, and, and, and responded, 50% of them didn't answer questions seven, eight, and nine. Why? You know, you as the, as, the, as, as the person reading that should be able to pick up the nuances of that in the paper. Is there any ethical considerations? Have they behaved ethically? Is there something, you know, underpinning their work that actually isn't eth ethical? So, so again, you need to put those elements to your work in terms of what you're doing. These are just uh, elements to actually prompt you to think about where the paper should be. A narrative thread. <clears throat> Okay, and the difficulty with narrative thread is that actually people actually going through a narrative are telling a story, but they don't necessarily tell it in a logical, informative, persuasive, comprehensive way. Okay, and, and it's, you know, you know, when you read a good story, you know, that's what the thesis in a PhD should be. That's what a paper should be. That's what a conference paper or a journal article should be. A story. You know, introduce it, you know, tell what happened, what you found and what you're going to do in the future or what it might impact on, you know. So, so again, navigate your, you know, way through that. And again, some papers are difficult to find a way through the narrative. It can be difficult to read. Okay. We've all read books that we found really difficult to get into or, you know, the, the, the author has, you know, come back and forth and back and forth, and you're really not getting a sense of what that journey is. You know, that, that it, it's the same for reading papers. If you're reading a narrative paper, you actually are reading a story. So it's important that it's logical. It's important that it's persuasive, comprehensive, and interesting. Okay, so that, that's really, really important. <clears throat> so tips. Save papers and references in the correct format as you go, maybe in online. Take notes summarizing each relevant paper you read as you go. Uh, I think one of the difficulties you know, people find is that they actually start into something, they haven't planned their time well, and they actually run out of time, you know, and they don't reference the work properly or they move on and do something else and they haven't captured it. They go back to it a while later and they actually realize I didn't capture this correctly, you know, or, you know, you're saving your paper and you save it in the wrong file because you're rushing out to get the train or the bus or you're meeting people, you know. So, 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 you know, plan your time correctly, you know, and do that work logically in a fashion that is not under pressure, that's not putting you under pressure. Uh, use, if you're a PhD student or a master's student, use your supervisor. You know, to discuss things, you know, I found I, ha I have a mentor still. I still go to that mentor and discuss things, you know, and I'm at the latter end of my career, but I still have someone I actually engage with, you know, because even at my stage, I get papers rejected from journals, you know, and when you get that email or you get that notification of, of a rejection, that's really, really hard to take. You are very vulnerable you actually, you know, someone has criticized your work, probably rightly so, you know, but, but again, that's really, really hard to navigate, 
So I work with my mentor and we talk about the work that we're doing. Now we're in the same area, so that really, really helps. And we share work, et cetera. So, so it's, you know, have a mentor, you know, have peers around you, maybe rely on the experts, you know, use the, the librarians in, in, are very, very helpful people in the library, you know, um, and they are sources for feedback and discussion, really. So, so I would encourage you to actually, you know, look to a, having a way where you can actually get support in the work that you do, because we all miss stuff, you know, and we all have a perspective, you know, a bias or a position. And sometimes it takes someone else just to point you in the right direction where it actually will help you to, to, to actually refocus and, and, and pick up that, that missing element. You know? Deconstruct the topic into its basic elements. Again, spend the time on that. It's not just about reading paper after paper after paper after paper. There may be elements within a paper that you want to actually get to. Critically analyze the papers you read and don't be over critical, okay? Because again, we're moving things on, but sometimes the topic or the research area is not ready for that move on yet. That other areas have to be overcome before you get there. And what I would say to you is, and this is kind of a bugbear of mine, people just have a heading literature review. Well, why not title it something else? Exploring the landscape of whatever, or this is just an analysis of the research that's out there. Don't just stick in literature review. It's actually, you know, if you, if you try and think of it from the reviewer's point of view, and that's why I have this in here, when I read papers, oh, here we go, patter, 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 paper such says this, paper that says the other, paper whatever, and then there's no criticality. You know, that's, you know, that's just presentation of, of the literature, you know. So, so if it's, a, you know, if it's, you know, exploring the landscape or views of the researchers in a particular field, call it that, you know. Yeah, it, it, you know, unless, of course, the discipline doesn't allow that. And, and you know, again, you have to navigate that. But within our field, I would encourage people not to just call it things literature review. So in summary, you know, li uh, literature review is working with literature. You know, so there's four headings there. You know, you find it, you manage it, you use it, you review, review it. OK, and you can see then falling out of each of those headings, you know, know the literature types within your discipline, use the resources available, hone your search skills, hone your criticality skills. You know, when you manage that literature, then when you get a hold of it, you know, read efficiently. And when I say efficiently, they know you, you will have picked up that I was saying to you, you know, don't spend time on papers that are not relevant. Yes, it might be an interesting read, but how? How does it relate to the, to the literature that you're reviewing? Keep track, keep, have a filing system, write relevant annotations, write relevant uh, uh, summaries so that you can, when you read them later on, that you understand what they are. And um, then use it, choose your research topic, you know, and fit, fit the literature into that topic, developing your, your question. So your literature review should refine that research question that you're, you're looking for or that you're moving towards. Uh, argue, uh, use the literature to argue your rationale for the position that you have. Uh, and this should inform your study, but also the theory, the theoretic theory, theory around the subject area. And again, use the literature to design the method or methodology that you use. And then review it, understanding lit review's purpose, ensuring adequate coverage, write purposefully, and then working on style and tone. Because remember, if you put a literature review together, you someone's going to read that, whether it's an examiner, whether it's a, a journal editor, whether it's a, a policy holder, whatever, you know. So, so you need to couch it in a particular way. You know, if it's, if it's the policy holders, et cetera, you're going to couch it in a particular style and tone, where if it's in a journal, you're going to actually... Um, presented in a different way also. So, so you know, uh, literature review can be, you know, seen as a real challenge, you know, look at it as, as, as a means to what it is you want to actually demonstrate around your knowledge in the area and, you know, work yourself through, through that process and, and, and enjoy it, you know. So really that's me encompassing all the elements of, of the talk and, I'm happy to take questions now at this stage. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lloyd. 
this is shikarora thank you so much for Hi. a very Hi, for a, thank you so much for a very informative uh, presentation on various dimensions of the literature review. Uh, with your permission, I would just take up a few questions. OK, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the first question is uh, from Dr. Sanjeev Tandon. And uh, he has asked a question, how relevant are very old research papers in terms of years of publication for a research review process? Okay, so 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 uh, literature is important. So it, to understand uh, to understand the topic, first of all, you need to know the historical literature. Okay, its relevance in the research really depends on the topic. So so the so the topic and the research area may have moved on, so it may not be cutting edge research. Or a seminal material, but but it, but it actually does demonstrate the evolution of the actual research area. So that's really really important, particularly if if uh, you're presenting a paper or or or, or, or a, a thesis that is mapping out the research area. Uh, it may not be relevant if you're actually doing a journal paper or or a conference paper just reporting an aspect of the research so it is, so the historical elements may not need to be actually included but to understand the subject area seminal previous research is really really important yeah but it may not necessarily find its way into a publication that you have other than maybe a research thesis hopefully that answers the, the question okay Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there's another question uh, from Dr. Vivek Pachori. What points are to be taken care of while writing a review paper? Uh, what should be the ending point for a review paper? Should it be left at the research gaps or should it have some other conclusion? Well, again, that really depends on, on, on what the researcher is actually uh, looking at, what, what sort of paper it is. Uh, if, for example, the paper is a literature review paper that's published, well, what should be coming out of that literature review is, uh, you know, and, and the concluding points is, you know, what, what's the argument that the authors are making and how do they back up that argument? Uh, what what, are, what uh, literature are they drawing on to actually make that point? If they're presenting a piece of research, you know, the, 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 the critical element for the reviewer, the person looking at that literature is, you know, can they actually say through the process that the researchers have carried out that it's actually, you know, correct and the arguments are made that they actually stand up? Uh, how does that link to other actual research? You know, so that can they draw a comparison with other work that's been published in that area? So that they'd be the two elements, I, okay. I would say, in relation to that. OK, OK. Uh, so there's another question from Ms. Osama. Is theoretical paper, are they equal in terms of their value uh, with empirical research, for particularly in uh, academic area? OK. So again, it really depends on the subject area. Okay, and that might seem like I'm not answering the question. You know, um, theoretical papers are really, really important when a subject area is presenting how, it, how it's situated theoretically, okay? The empirical work that if someone's mm -hmm. presenting the research that they've found in relation to that area, that's vitally important too, because that would underpin and support the theoretical work so, so to me, it really depends on, on how you would be evaluating, you know, a paper, whether you're actually looking at it from a theoretical perspective or whether you're looking at it from the empirical research that's actually been delivered. So to me, it really very much depends. One is not better than the other. It actually depends on what it is you're actually evaluating. If you're evaluating its contribution to the theoretical underpinnings within the subject area, that's really, really important, you know, because subject areas are developing all the time. Some, per some subject areas, and I would use my, my own construction management as an example, 
we are, you know, we're, we're about 60 years in existence in terms of publishing our research work. And, and it's only now that we are really getting well established and having good uh, informed discourse around the theoretical underpinnings in our subject area. You know, because what we have now is in, in the related academic journals, we have people writing about that. If you take educational research, for example, the theoretical underpinnings of educational research have always been challenged by the different philosophical positions out there. So again, that debate and that discourse is really important. And some journals deal with that really, really well. But then other journals deal with empirical research findings and work that's coming from the research field. And they deal with that. As, and none is, as, one is not better than the other. I think uh, the, the subject disciplines demonstrate their actual maturity and development around the areas. So it really depends on a continuum where the, where the subject area is. If they, if they respect more empirical work within a field, it'll be more empirical work that's actually delivered and there'll be less discourse around theoretical. But if they actually value the theoretical inputs, there'll be work on theoretical. And that's why I say in our own discipline, we're moving more towards theoretical. So it's okay. harder in one particular journal, it's actually harder to get published unless you actually really spend time on the theoretical. So they expect you to, to, to develop that. So again, what I would say to people is if they're looking at their work and they want to publish in a particular journal, what I would say to them is read the previous publications in that journal. If they're theoretical, if they're going towards a bias for theoretical, well then if your work is theoretical, move towards that. Where if it's empirical work and you know it's research findings that, that they're really focused on, well actually, if that's that fits with your work, then 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 actually uh, uh, publish it there, you know. Um, but again, it, it's it's about finding, you know, your own particular position, and what subject area and discipline uh, you're comfortable in, and what research journals conferences actually resonate with your subject area and are accepting towards the work that you 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 are publishing or want to publish. Thank you so for giving clarity on this. Uh, so this next question from Ms. Hema Nidhi Gupta, and she has asked, what is the difference between research approach and theory? Are papers based on approach acceptable by the journals? Um, OK. So, so research approach uh, really should form part of your paper. You know, the approach, you, if, you're, if you're presenting on empirical research that you found something, so, so you, your research approach to me should f sit in, in your paper. Uh, you know, your literature review should, should actually justify uh, the research approach that you've taken. Uh, it's generally not accepted that just your research approach is put into a conference paper. So, so it would be, you know, your, your research approach would form part of a paper and actually would your paper would be reporting the actual findings from that research. Hopefully I've, I've understood the question correctly. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think that answers the question. Uh, okay. So there's another question which is related to a book chapter. Uh, yeah. Ms. Farhat has asked, could you please give a little insight about writing a book chapter? Does it also require to review literature and what should be the format? Okay, again, that really depends on what the, the actual book is, is, is actually focused on. Um, if I could use an example, for example, uh, use an example from my own publications. So I did a, a, bo a book chapter in a built environment education uh, um, uh, book last, last year. And I was invited to actually write, write a chapter on the pedagogical approach that I used with students for, for uh, an international competition. So within that, what I did was I, I, I wrote about the underpinning theory for my pedagogical approach. So it was a collaborative learning. So I, I, I actually did the research around collaborative learning 
and uh, you know uh, navigate it through the, the the approaches that educators take for collaborative learning and 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 uh, uh, included the principles of collaborative learning as part of that chapter. But then I also reported on the experience and the feedback from the students in terms of their experience. So what I you know it was it was somewhat like a research paper because I was giving the qualitative findings from from the from the, from the actual students I, I was engaged with, and then I had a conclusion which used the literature to support the actual elements I found from the experience of the students. So again, it re a chapter will really depend on what it is you know the editors are looking for within that. You know, it could be just a theoretical chapter where you're just writing about the theory of a subject area. So it really very much depends on what the chapter reports or what the chapter is telling. Yeah. Okay. Right, sir. Uh, so there is next question from Mr. Amul Kumar, and he's asking what must be the ideal reference number for journals uh, for doing a PhD? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that really depends on the subject area that really very much depends on the candidate you know yeah. and and, it, and to me it's not about putting a number on it you know uh, the important uh, element for for any thesis is that you know that the you know if we if we take the literature review chapter that the candidate has presented the literature in the subject area that they have presented mm -hmm. the, the, the up-to-date literature, but also that they've gone back in time and navigated through the seminal lit literature from the past, okay? So you can't put a figure on how many citations or references should be included in that. Uh, there also should be, in terms of the methodology chapter, you know, the methodological approach, there should be, you know, reference to the theoretical underpinnings, the epistemological, the ontological, and the axiological positioning of the, the researcher in the subject area. There should be a justification of the uh, from the literature around the methodologies taken. You know, it's mixed methods. You know, why was it chosen? What literature actually encouraged them to choose that? Uh, also, then around the ethical uh, elements, there should be reference to literature on ethical uh, positioning. Uh, there should be elements of uh, reflection in that and li linked to the, to, to the uh, references on reflection. So, so in terms of a number, I wouldn't give a number. Uh, you know, okay. it, it would be unfair to give a number because it really very much depends on the subject area. But, but what yeah. I would say is that it would be really, really important that the actual author of the thesis covers all the relevant literature. Yeah. Okay. Very true, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> uh, sir, there is another question from Dr. Omer. I would uh, please like to know the importance of meta analysis in writing of empirical papers. Okay. Yeah, again, meta analysis, um, again, it really very much depends on the subject area and what's available in that subject area. Um, you know, if, if it's if it's if it's a, an approach to be taken, you know, then you know I would encourage it to be taken. But again, it very much depends on subject area and and you know wh what's what's agreed and what's the norm within that subject area. I know for us in in construction management, we really don't rely on meta analysis. So, so again, if, if within the business or, or the information technology or the science area, if if that approach is is encouraged, then I would encourage someone.